Oh, hi there. With the rise of NFTs, the concept has basically taken over internet discussion. I keep seeing this comparison between owning an NFT and owning the original of a piece of art. That even if you buy a print of a painting or just right click a JPEG, owning the original is still worth more. But this comparison is flawed. There are intricate details in original works of art, whether it be a painting, mural, or sculpture, that cannot be replicated one to one. Brush strokes, layers, the textures of the oil, and other unique properties that cannot be exactly cloned. It's comparable to hearing a recording of music Music versus hearing it live. A recording can be a great representation and makes the art more accessible, but something is lost in the conversion process. This all makes the feeling of owning the original canvas an artist toiled over something very special and tragic when lost. And that's what I want to talk about today. Works of art by some of the world's most revered artists that cannot be found or can never be recovered. I'll even throw in a work that was rediscovered thanks to Stuart Little of all things. But I'm not going to talk about any art destroyed by the Nazis because that topic has more than enough for its own video. If you have any suggestions for future videos, know of any interesting lost art, or just want to say oh hi there, let me know in the comments or find me on Twitter at Lost Media Mike. So here are just a few of the many pieces of lost art. But first, allow me to destroy your gallery. Bullshit. Bullshit. Derivative. The Stolen and Destroyed Works by Stefan Breitweiser and Anne Catherine Kleinklaus. When you think of the typical art thief, you might imagine a well-orchestrated heist, each member highly trained with their own special skills, whose goal is to flip the art for a profit to the highest bidder. Well, Stefan Breitweiser and Anne Catherine Kleinklaus are not your typical art thieves. Born in the 70s, Stefan and Anne are among the world's most notorious and consistent art thieves, averaging one stolen piece of art every 15 days for six years between 1995 and 2001, amassing a colossal collection of 239 works from 172 museums around Europe, all while Stefan was working as a waiter. Imagine that the next time the Denny's wait staff is taking your order. But the craziest part is they just loved art. They didn't sell anything. They just thought they were neat, particularly the masterpieces of the 16th and 17th century. In Stefan's own words, I love such works of art. I collect them and keep them at home. They began their career in March of 1995 when visiting the Swedish medieval castle of Gruyere. They came across a small work by Christian Wilhelm Dietrich that they had to have. Anne kept watch while Stefan pulled the nails out of the frame, removing the painting. After this, they were hooked and would repeat this method for years, taking advantage of lax security on galleries across Europe. The two peaked earlier in their career, stealing their most valuable work in 1995, Lucas Cranach the Elders, Sybil the Princess of Cleves, with an estimated value of over 5 million euros that they were able to lift from a Sotheby's auction before it was sold. Stefan considered himself the wealthiest man in Europe with his private collection, and despite having tens of millions of dollars in stolen art, my guy just stored them in his bedroom at his mom's house, being careful to keep them out of direct sunlight. He even had the guts to get them professionally reframed, and the framer was none the wiser that he was handling classic works. His mom, Muriel Brettweiser, thought the whole thing was legit, and her son would just bind them from auctions, until 1997 when he was finally caught, for the first time. Yes, because we know their names and the extent of their crimes, their reign at the throne of art theft would not last forever. In 97, they received special permission to view a William Van Elst landscape at a private collection in Sweden. As they made their way out with the painting, the owner chased them as they got into Brett Weiser's mom's car and they were caught red-handed. They were turned into the Swedish police and given an eight-year suspended sentence and banned from the country until 2000. But as we're gonna find out, Stefan was stubborn, fearless, and probably a little foolish. Even though he was banned from the country, he would travel to Sweden daily for work and continue to steal more art. Until November 2001, Stefan was caught stealing a three-of-a-kind 1584 bugle from the Richard Wagner Museum in Switzerland. The two were spotted but managed to escape. For some reason, this didn't deter Stefan, and two days later, Later, he was caught casing the joint by the same security guard who had previously spotted him. Because Stefan's mother lived in France, Swedish officials were not able to require an international search warrant until 19 days later. By the time the police got there, they found nothing. Because in this 19 day period, Stefan's mom, Muriel, destroyed everything. Hundreds of paintings, artifacts, instruments, sculptures were broken, torn apart, shredded in the garbage disposal, and thrown in a local canal. Stefan would finally confess to his crimes after months in a Swedish prison, admitting to every single piece of art he stole. And during his trial, he would even interrupt the prosecution to correct their details on his collection. 
Muriel would confess seven months later as pieces started washing up on shore. She said she did it out of anger at her son and had no idea how valuable the art was, but we all know she was ride or die and tried to cover up for her son. Around 110 pieces from his collection survived or partially survived destruction. Stefan and Muriel were given three years in prison, only serving 26 and 18 months respectively, and would spend six months in jail. After his prison sentence, his illustrious career became a source of pride, and in 2006 he published his autobiography, Confessions of an Art Thief. Anne learned her lesson and was out of the business, but even though Stefan was publicly known as the world's most prolific art thief, he would not stop. In 2011, he was caught again where authorities found 30 more paintings in his house. He was hit with another three-year sentence. After spending years of his life in jail, this was not enough to stop him. And after monitoring his activities for years, authorities caught him again in 2019. But this time, it seems to be about more than just collecting nice art, finding over 163,000 euros around his mom's house. Today, Stefan and Anna's combined art theft is estimated to have been over $1.4 billion, most of which was destroyed. The 2010 Heist at the Museum of Modern Art I always think of big art heists as something of the past. I guess in my mind, the natural progression goes stagecoach heists, train robberies in the Wild West, art heists, then cybercrime today. So I guess a group of ne'er-do-wells were kicking it old school back in 2010 when the doors of the Museum of Modern Art in Paris were opened to find five masterpieces stolen in the night. The thieves managed to bypass the security system and evade the museum's night guards, making out with an estimated $123 million worth of art. Known as the largest art heist in 20 years, the lifted pieces include Pastoral by Henri Matisse, Olive Tree by George Brock, Woman with Fan by Amido Modigliani, Still Life with Candlestick by Fernand Ledger, and the crown jewel Pablo Picasso's Dove with Peas. Not too long after, Vernon Tomic was identified as the thief and arrested. Two of his accomplices would soon follow, but claimed to have thrown away the paintings after hearing the police were looking for them. At the trial, one of them said, I threw them into the trash. I made the worst mistake of my existence. But no one was buying it. Even one of the accomplices said he was too smart to throw away a hundred million dollars worth of art. Officials believe the paintings could have made their way to China. Though the art is basically unsellable outside of a black market, all five masterpieces remain lost, possibly destroyed. Following the tradition of stolen art being featured in James Bond movies, pieces from the stolen collection appear in the credits of Skyfall and in Blofeld's lair in the movie Spectre. Oh, I've got to stare at traffic, yawn, lick myself. And believe me, that could take hours if you do it right. Stuart Little's Lost Painting Stuart Little is a pretty strange movie when you take a step back and look at it. Written by M. Night Shyamalan, of all people, starring Thelma from Thelma and Louise, Dr. House, and is about a family that adopts a mouse. Imagine being an orphan and a family chooses a mouse over you. For how strange the movie is, the most unusual part can actually be found in its set decorations. Ten years after the movie first came out, art historian Gergli Barkey was watching the movie on TV in 2009 with his three-year-old daughter, and in the background, he saw something he didn't expect, a painting that was strangely familiar. Gergli immediately identified the painting as that of avant-garde artist Rupert Berini, his painting Sleeping Lady with Black Vase, something that he and the rest of the art world believed was lost. This Art Deco inspired oil painting of his sleeping wife was painted between 1927 and 28 after the artist fled Berlin during World War I. The painting was last seen in 1928 on exhibit at the Ernest Museum in Budapest. It's believed to have been sold to a Jewish man who left Budapest just before or during World War II, during which Hungary would become a member of the Axis powers, persecuting, among others, the Jewish population. The war, compounded with the work of art never being seen since, it was assumed to be among the many pieces of lost art stemming from World War II, which just so happens to include a large portion of Rupert Berini's other works. Gergely Barkey had only seen black and white photos of the painting taken in 1928 that were held in a museum archive. I knew this painting from a black and white photograph. I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought I was daydreaming. Even though the movie was playing on TV and he couldn't pause or rewind it, the painting was shown enough times that Barkey was sure the painting was the original lost art and doubted it was a reproduction since it wasn't very well known. 
In reality, the painting was never really lost, just being traded hands over the years by people who didn't know its rarity or value. It was sold for $40 at a San Diego auction in the mid 90s, then sold to an antique store in Pasadena, California for $400, where it was bought for $500 on behalf of Sony Pictures for use in set decoration. The painting would be used in various soap operas and the show Family Law before finally making its way into Stuart Little. After two years of searching, Barky was able to track down the movie's set designer who had bought the painting off Sony Pictures to hang in her own home. The painting ultimately sold to an unnamed Hungarian collector in 2014 for $285,700. Because of its unusual discovery, Rupert Barini's Sleeping Lady with Black Vase is now considered the most famous Hungarian painting. Leonardo da Vinci's Lost Medusa Leonardo da Vinci has quite a few lost and unrealized works, but one of his oldest and most elusive is the head of Medusa. The lost painting is described in Giorgio Varsari's biography on Leonardo written in 1568. As a young man, da Vinci painted a depiction of Medusa on a wooden shield at the request of his father, Sir Piero da Vinci. He wanted to paint something that would terrify anyone who came across it, choosing Medusa in hopes that it would stun enemies just as she stunned her own. According to the biography, da Vinci brought into his study and even dissected a variety of small animals and insects to help inspire his painting, ending up with a terrifyingly mangled sight of frogs, lizards, rats, locusts, and of course, snakes. Medusa was represented with fiery eyes and venomous smoke coming from her mouth. Without Leonardo's knowledge, his dad sold the shield to a Florence merchant and the shield eventually made its way to the Duke of Milan. Historians have doubted the validity of this story and even the existence of Leonardo's Medusa shield, but it's seemingly verified by other artists who are believed to have seen the painting in the collection of Ferdinand de Medici and made their own versions possibly inspired by da Vinci's work. Both Sir Peter Paul Rubens and Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio have their own depictions of Medusa, but we can never really know how influenced they were by da Vinci's Medusa or if they ever actually saw it. Another da Vinci biographer, Luigi Nanzi, discovered a Medusa painting that he believed to be Leonardo's lost work in 1782 in the Uffizi Gallery, a historic art museum in Florence. The Uffizi painting was long attributed to da Vinci, and even though it matches descriptions almost perfectly, into the 20th century, historians were able to trace this painting to an anonymous Flemish painter in the 1600s. Some art historians do believe this could be a recreation of da Vinci's Medusa, but again, we can never know for sure unless Leonardo da Vinci's lost painting is is one day discovered. Historians have no idea what could have became of the shield and have no potential theories. But, but, but he's a communist. Oh, we just attended a couple of meetings. Diego Rivera's communist controversy, Man at the Crossroads. Diego Rivera was a Mexican-born painter known internationally for his incredible murals that established the mural movement throughout the world. Rivera's 1931 painting, The Rivals, holds the record for the highest priced artwork by a Latin American artist to be sold at auction, and his mural art have been declared historical monuments in Mexico. Unlike so many other artists, Rivera was revered in his lifetime and was commissioned for high-profile mural work for the San Francisco Stock Exchange, the National Palace in New Mexico, and for the Ford Motor Company. But his most famous and most controversial is his 1934 mural, Man at the Crossroads. In the 30s, John D. Rockefeller Jr. was involved in the construction of Rockefeller Center and wanted a 63 by 17 foot mural at the focal point of the main building. John's wife, Abby Rockefeller, who had previously bought Rivera's paintings, met Rivera at an event and he became friends with the whole Rockefeller family. They decided to commission Rivera for the mural with the brief theme, Man at the Crossroads looking with hope and high vision to the choosing of a new and better future. Rivera proposed a three-panel mural, the center with a worker controlling machinery flanked by two panels, one representing capitalism and the other representing communism. But the thing about Diego Rivera is he is a well-known proponent of communism, and one of the richest families in world history, the Rockefellers, might have some different views on that. And this wasn't something that Rivera kept secret either. It would often come out in his works. His mural at Ford even had a disclaimer installed about his communist beliefs. 
Rivera sketched a blueprint of the mural, and somehow the Rockefellers approved it, maybe because they were friends. Choosing Rivera to paint the mural was a controversial decision, and the New York World Telegram called it anti-capitalist propaganda. And let's be honest, it totally was. Maybe not as obvious as a soy jack, but the capitalist side was darker with rich businessmen, war machines, soldiers in gas masks, and police brutality, while the communist side was brighter, having protesting workers, political figures holding hands with the people, and general working class folk. Seemingly out of spite, Rivera decided to lean into the criticism and without the Rockefeller's knowledge, added a portrait of communist leader Vladimir Lenin. And Rivera almost got away with it, but a worker was applying paint to a wall above the mural and accidentally dropped some paint that just happened to land on the portrait of Lenin. It was immediately brought to the Rockefeller's attention. Despite all the other communist symbols on the mural, the Rockefellers were only offended by Lenin, not with May Day or even the hammer and sickle, and requested that Rivera remove him. Rivera declined, suggesting that he add Abraham Lincoln to the other side of the mural, but refused to remove Lenin. In what Rivera would refer to as the Battle of Rockefeller Center, he would attempt to continue working on his mural despite heckling before finally being ordered to stop. He was still paid for his work, but removed from the project, and because of the controversy, he would lose a commission to paint a mural for General Motors. The mural was covered up with a cloth while they decided on what to do with it, leading to heated debates over politics and artistic censorship. The mural was covered until February 1934 when it was ordered to be destroyed, leading to protests that only stopped when Rivera said he preferred the mural be destroyed rather than altered, and its destruction would only advance the cause of the labor revolution. In 1937, the mural was replaced with American Progress by Josef Maria Sert. Only black and white photos exist of the incomplete mural that were taken when Rivera thought it might be destroyed. He would later use these photos to reconstruct the painting in Mexico City on a smaller scale called Man, Controller of the Universe. And the recreation absolutely roasts John Rockefeller Jr., showing him drinking with a woman, both having the syphilis bacteria above their head, and John's known for not drinking alcohol. The controversy was shown in the movies Cradle Will Rock and Frida, and of course, in an episode of The Simpsons, Now Museum, Now You Don't. Thank you so much for watching. This video is out of my usual wheelhouse, but I had such a great time making it and I will definitely make a part two someday. So let me know what you want me to cover next time and if you know of any obscure pieces of lost art. This is Mike with All Things Lost. See you soon.